Hi, I'm Laura. Hi, I'm Deanne. And hi, I'm Philippe. And welcome to our Lyman Book Club. We are reading The Ring Castle by Dorothy Dunnett. Uh, and today we're going to talk about part two, chapters eight, nine, and ten. Philippe will lead our discussion, but before we dive in, initial reactions to these chapters. Uh, I really didn't like the first chapter at all because of what happens to our dear Adam Blacklock, although he's still alive, I think. Um, and then the next two chapters were interesting. Um, it felt like a sort of different genre of novel that we just jumped ourselves into. Like it, it's going back to adventure, which is a nice refreshing uh, bit for this book because it's been so sort of like one thing the whole time so far. And yeah, there's some stuff that was interesting that happens in another assassination attempt on Lyman and. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, chapter eight was super sad and just like, oh, uh, horrible things are happening to people I like, <laughs> which I feel, I feel like that should be the tagline for this entire series. <laughs> horrible things are happening to people I like. <laughs> um, yeah. And then, and then uh, chapters nine and 10 it sort of felt like a, kind of almost like a buddy movie, you know, <laughs> like uh, it was neat to see Chancellor, I, I really enjoyed Chancellor's perspective in these chapters and just his um, getting to know Lyman and kind of becoming intrigued with Lyman and that, that whole, um, sort of journey from very, very angry to desperately trying to rescue him from this assassination attempt. Like it was a really nice journey in those two chapters. So, yeah. Um, I know before we even started reading this book, after the tragic events of last book, we were discussing who is gonna be the person that sort of finds Lyman and snaps him out of his, his reverie or, or you know his depression i did not think that dickon would be the one and i'm not assuming that it is going to be him but i think he's going to play a part in sort of bringing lyman back to scotland so mm -hmm. yeah i really love their um i really love their like bonding moment in is it in a church where they're yeah they can't sleep and so they stay up talking and yeah like just the complete transformation of what he thought Lyman was mm -hmm. versus what Lyman actually is. And he starts to get insight into who Lyman is and the way that they bond over like how they have to be a merchant and a warrior in the world they live in. But what they really are, are like people who want to learn and explore. Mm -hmm. um, it's such a lovely thing for them to bond over. And then you kind of realize like, the reason why Lyman wanted Chancellor to go on this journey so badly is because he had read the book that he co-wrote and he was kind of fanboying him and was like, it would be such a tragedy if this brilliant guy didn't go on this adventure. So I have to make sure he goes because he's going to love it. And it's important for the world to like get his perspective. And I just, I love that, like under all this coldness that's going on with Lyman, like there's still that Lyman underneath that would do something like that. Yeah, and I also I also love this glimpse <clears throat> of we don't often see Lyman with a peer. Like he's often in a sort of mentor-mentee relationship or in a power relationship, you know, like there's <clears throat> you just don't often see him sort of sit down and talk with someone as a peer and so I agree that conversation over like maps and all the explorers that they had both read and knew and and it was it was almost like those conversations that you have at like a fan convention where it's like oh I saw this person I saw that person and did you see this episode of this you know and and just that kind of vibe to the conversation which was really delightful so yeah and it's so apropos to the era of the books, you know, they're, they're in the early Renaissance, the, the, the cutting edge of their culture is this 
learning and exploring right now. Um, so that, that they're both these like men of their time or a little bit ahead of their time, pushing their time forward and how they bond over that is just really cool. Yeah, yeah, it is really fun. And I <sighs> really hope that <laughs> this, like their friendship grows and Dickon doesn't die in some like horrible, bloody manner, but I don't know, I'm holding, I'm holding on to things loosely with an open hand. Oh. You know, like they don't get snatched away at any moment. So I, I have a feeling that they will both survive the sleigh wreckage that happened at the end of our reading. Um, but who knows what's going to happen later in this book. I mean, Lyman certainly is going to survive. He's still got another book contracted in his six book contract. So can't die yet. Right. Which is why people need to stop trying to assassinate him because it's not going to work. Right, right. And uh, I will say I am less convinced. I feel like I'm less convinced over time that Lyman's actually going to survive this series. I mean, obviously he's going to survive in book five because he's in book six. Um, but I'm not completely convinced he's going to survive book six, which is very disturbing to me. I don't I don't like the possibility that my main character might die, but I feel like there's genuine danger that, like, I do not feel like Dunnett is unwilling to kill anyone, <laughs> so. Um, I think she's proven that she will do pretty much anything. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know if she's gonna definitively kill him, but I could see her ending the series in a like, is he alive or is he dead kind of way? Like leading it up to the reader to decide what they assume happens. I mean, I can totally see him like the last page of the book is like him dying in the arms of Sibylla or or um, Philippa or Jarrett or something. <laughs> and like, I can totally see that happening. Um, ha which I really, really don't want, so. Was there something in these chapters that made you think that? Well, I think it's the black lock. Just, just reminded again that like characters, like bad stuff happens to characters I like and yeah. Yeah. Should we dive in? Sure. So we're gonna start with chapter eight. It is the Feast of the Epiphany. Now, D, is that a Christmas kind of thing or Easter? I yeah, could... Ep Epiphany is the feast after. So the 12 days of Christmas are yeah. actually, day one is Christmas. <laughs> and day, people often think of it as like you end the 12 days of Christmas with Christmas, but you don't, you start them. And then Epiphany is the end. So okay. it's when the wise men come to the baby Jesus. Okay, so that gives us, it's December-ish. So that gives us the time of year. It's the feast. It's what? January. Oh, it's January, right, because two weeks after Christmas yeah. would be January. Um, so they go to church for the Feast of the Epiphany, and then there's a sleigh ride back to the Kremlin, um, which the Muscovy Company is sort of following along with Lyman in the Tsar's procession. Um, while they're on their way back to the church, Adam Blacklock starts yelling because he sees the three uh, people that he's been sort of teaching painting to in dire situations are they dead or they've just been flogged or something they're not dead they've been flailed which flailed. is worse than what like their skin has come off hmm. um and i think at one point chancellor said they're not dead but only because they're russian like they're hardy russian so they're yeah like, really like, <laughs> um so because adam is putting up such a fuss in front of the czar. Uh, Lyman steps up and whips Adam across the face. Not cool, number one. Um, it turns out that the church wants Adam Blacklock to be arrested and then probably put to death for trying to teach these three artists um, oil painting instead of their iconography, which shows you like how much power the church has in the Russian state. Um, so, they end up after discussing with the Tsar that they're not going to kill him, but they want him to be flailed, Adam Blacklock. Lyman asks for him to be the one to do it. And they decide that it will be done later that night after the um, feast. And it happens. Unfortunately, he does flail 
Adam. Adam's in a pretty bad state. Um, Dick and Chancellor thinks this is horrific, so he cancels his plans to go to Lampoznia. And then the St. Mary's crew sort of waits up all night to see how Adam is doing. And that's how the chapter ends. It's a pretty short chapter, but a lot to unpack about it. So I'm very curious about you guys' take on what's going on beneath the surface here, especially with like why Lyman does this and responds the way he does. Well, I think there's multiple issues happening here. I, the big one I think is he, the end result of this whole thing is that Adam doesn't die. Like there's a potential for Adam not to die. And I think if, if Lyman had not stepped forward, it, he would have, Lockhawk would have died. So as I read that scene, I really read it as again with the chess metaphors, but um, I really read it as Lyman playing chess with the church and the czar, the, like those three entities in this triangle of negotiation about Blacklock and that Lyman basically lost every gambit that, because he tried several, like you could kind of see him try a thing and it failed and thing and it failed, you know, like, can we just, you know, imprison him? Can we do like this? Can we, can I flail, you know? And, and it was just this little bits of him trying to make it not as bad and it failed, but he ultimately was able to control to some extent what happened to Blacklock, even though it was the method of punishment forced him. It was, I mean, there wasn't a way to mitigate that completely, but you do get a sense that he mitigated it somewhat because Adam survived and Chancellor makes a comment at one point that if Adam, like Adam would die from this punishment. He's like, there's no way he would survive. And he did survive. So it mean, I think that means that Lyman was able to mitigate it in some way. Um, but yeah, I saw the whole thing as Lyman trying to save him and being backed into a very, very, very difficult corner. Um, yeah, he's, he's kind of forced to do the things he does. He knows that there's no way in order to keep the guise of whatever he's doing with the Tsar um, under control, he's got to step into the role of being the Punisher here. Um, and I agree with Dee, he's definitely doing it to mitigate whatever damage is going to happen to Adam. Um, now, because of what happens, he does still have to be pretty forceful about it, because I think the Tsar and his men would know if he was holding out at all. Yeah. And there's also, like, I don't think they can save him. Like there's, you know, you sort of get a sense of, well, what if they just like grabbed him and ran, you know, but I don't think that's an option mm -hmm. in this context. Like they're completely surrounded by the enemy, if you will. And there's just, there's no way to save him without Lyman convincing the czar that one, he doesn't care that much. Like he's got it, he's kind of got this he's not, beg you know, like, I'm not begging for his life kind of thing. So he's got a sense that like, oh, this isn't that important to me. And I'm on the czar, like he has to convince the czar that he's 100% on his side and he's completely loyal to him. So without those two things happening, I don't think Adam survives this night. So. Yeah, I think he, um, Lyman is walking a tightrope the whole time because if he goes too far defending Adam, the Tsar could turn on all of them and kill them all. Right. Um, and I, th I agree that he does save Adam because he, and I don't think he entirely loses. The gambit he wins is that he is the one right. to the flailing. Yeah. So I think he's then again, writing a very thin tightrope where he has to use enough force that they think he's using all his force, but he's almost certainly mitigating it a little bit because Adam yeah. survives. Right. And of course, yeah, the whole time he has to pretend he doesn't care. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But I do think that it's a pretense that he doesn't care. Like I, I, I do think that the cold, like the cold emotionless Lyman is still there to some extent, but I think he does care. Like the whole reason he's doing this is because he cares while putting on a facade that he doesn't. But I think it's a facade. 
to some extent at this point. That's also one of the interesting ambiguities in this book is we don't know how much of Lyman's coldness is genuine and how much is facade. Mm -hmm. It would be nice to just think, oh, it's he completely cares and he loves Adam, blah, 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 yeah. but you could also, he's, Lyman's is still like a mess and still has a lot of psychological damage and maybe he is, you know, to some degree, this level of cold. Yeah. And I think at this point, it's a, I think it's a both and. Like, I think he is still struggling with connecting emotionally with things. He is still struggling with, with that coldness. But he also cares. Like, it's not, I don't think he's completely divorced from compassion and caring for, for his men. But he's not the, he's not the Game of Kings lion, Lyman either, so. <laughs> and I think it shows that how much this disturbs him a little bit because at the end of the chapter he's summoned again to the Tsar's room for the night and they play chess and that very last line is Lyman loses so he played chess and lost which kind of almost is what happened in this chapter yeah. like he ended up winning a bit because Adam Blacklock is still alive but the whole sequence of events is a loss for him in this game of chess that he is playing yeah it's, I think that line is both a metaphorical loss over the day and mm -hmm. a literal loss that evening to, to the czar. I think it's also telling that the czar invites him to play chess and he first tries to decline. And of course, then the czar's like, you know, <laughs> you decline. And he's like, oh, of course I'll play with you. And he, and he does. But like his initial reaction is, like he really doesn't want to, right? He's not in the emotional state to go continue walking the tightrope with Ivan, but he has no choice and he has to do it. Um, but I think that is definitely an indication that he's experiencing you know, internal struggle over this. Um, what did you make of the line, the exchange between him and Adam? Where mm. Adam, I love the, I love the exchange, it's heartbreaking though. Adam says, once when you had been flogged at, your, at the post by your own men, I helped to save you. Mm -hmm. And Lyman replies, once you were Adam Blacklock, but I, sad to relate, was a different man. I, I mean, mean, sorry, go ahead. No, you. Part of it is performative because in between those lines, he had been overheard, someone uttered a swooping unsanity. Like, I'm assuming that one of the Russians heard this line who understands English and, you know, yeah. there's truth to it and it's performative at the same time because it's true. Lyman is a completely different man than he used to be at that moment then after everything that happened in the last book happened, so. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. Like, what's he gonna say? Oh, I'm gonna go easy on you? <laughs> like, he can't say that in this, there's no way that he can back off from what he's doing or give Adam any reassurance whatsoever. Um, but also, I think it's important to keep in mind that Lyman's self-image has never been good. <laughs> like his concept of who he is as a person has always been deeply flawed and has always leaned toward like, I'm bad. I'm not good enough in this situation. So this whole, like, I was a different man back then. Like you can see him having this, like, I'm broken. You know, like, and I'm, I cannot recover from this horrible choice that I made about my son, you know, and that he is like, I'm forever darkened by the, you know, like you can just see him saying, saying that and, so does he believe this? Yes, I think so. Like, I think it's both a performative statement and also something he believes, but not in a, not in a way that he's going to be cruel to Adam, but in a way that he can never go back to the person he was before kind of way. Yeah. Okay. I'm... I'm a little surprised and, and taken aback, really, that Lyman let this whole situation get to the point that he did. Like, that he didn't stop Adam Blacklock from 
doing this, knowing full well what might happen and what might be the consequences. Well, but he tried. I mean, yeah, he tried. We had that whole conversation earlier about where Adam had been in trouble and mm -hmm. and so. Right, but like all of all of um, Lyman's men knew that it was still happening. So like, I mean, I guess you can only go so far to try and stop somebody from doing something, but I'm, I'm a little surprised Lyman wasn't a little more forceful about it. So that's all. Yeah, I mean, he did say he was teaching them to oil paint at the dinner and then mm -hmm. like, you have to stop immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Like Adam's sort of ethics about art, like were, he disobeyed the, like he was given an order to stop and mm -hmm. he didn't. Not that he deserves this horrible fate. No, no. no. But no, I mean, I like, it's interesting because I'm, completely sympathetic to Adam about, you know, the independence of the artist, but it's also just a very unwise choice given the situation that they're in. It's it's not worth the risk to himself and to the people that he's teaching. Yeah. And you have to wonder like if his ultimate goal is to help people, you know, discover and understand art and their inner artists, like this was perhaps not the best way to go about it. <laughs> But yeah, you know, like you know Adam, right? He's hard is so good. And I, I'm sure that he really saw great potential in these people and was like loving, you know, mentoring them and teaching them. So of course he's just devastated and breaks all the rules when he sees that they've been hurt like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't think there's any surprise, unfortunately, that this is the level it got to. Like Lyman, it's not like Lyman was what's the word i want to say surprised again i don't want to say surprised again but like he should have known how much power the church has so that when they come forward and want to do this you know i think he does know yeah yeah i don't think he's surprised at all it's not i think it was i think this was almost inevitable like once once adam decided to do something that was against the Greek Orthodox Church, like this was going to happen because their concept of what's blasphemous and their concept of consequences for blasphemy, like Adam was going to run into those. It's not. Well, and Lyman warned him really clearly when he was in trouble the first time that the game he's playing with the artists, even though it seems innocent, has the potential to change the fate of nations because it could change who Ivan attacks and have him go a, a way that is unwise um, because of you know creating like religious wars. So like literally the fate of nations could depend on how they balance this tightrope act and Adam you know threw chaos into it and and took a big risk not just to himself and those men but also to like all the people that would die in war and yeah in the future of russia yeah and he just he didn't he didn't take the big picture into account and i think that's one thing we've talked about before is that lyman one of his strengths is that he sees the big picture you know he sees the entire game board if you will and well, it's like a strength and a weakness because yeah. it's the same thing that leads to Karadin's death you know lyman made a choice for the big picture but it's the devastating personal choice yeah yeah um i think also telling is that this happens right after the scene where the czar i don't know what he does with lyman he like blesses him or baptizes him or something oh yeah and there's a little bit of a disagreement of like lyman being allowed to to have this and the czar like make sure that he gets it so the czar has just honored him like above and beyond in front of everyone and so you know lyman like he's in a, a lot of danger to suddenly like go against the czar who just went you know out on a limb for him yeah. right not to mention i think the czar kind of pissed off the church a little bit because he and in, he insisted that lyman get this blessing and the church guy whatever his name was, I forgot. Um, they clearly had an argument about it. And so at this moment, the church guys pissed off at Lyman anyway. So it's another reason this whole thing doesn't go very well. But 
Um, oh, oh. Well, as, I was gonna say also just kind of telling is Christopher, who I think there's just little subtle hints in this that his hero worship of Lyman has suddenly changed. Yeah. Which is too bad, but it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, there was also just a couple of, uh, just a couple of random bits throughout the chapter that I underlined, like the fact that they're talking about um, the state of women in Russia and how there's on 270, Lyman makes this comment about um, their uh, culture wholly intolerant of gynarchy, which I thought was an interesting way to put this, but then they don't know what they're missing. But it's again, just another hint that like, they're not gonna allow women to have power, which again, brings up like, what is Gazelle doing in this country? And like, why is she trying this here? Um, so that's just another little like drop in that question bucket. Um, yeah. One of the things that stood out to me also is just, there are so many beautiful descriptions at the beginning of this chapter of the whole ceremony. Mm -hmm. um, and it's another one of those reminders that Dunnett was a painter, that she started out as a painter because of the way that she describes light, um, which always stands out to me because that amazing sword fight between Richard and Lyman in Game of Kings is so vivid in part because of the way she describes the light reflecting off the swords and windows and everything. Um, but there's just these beautiful descriptions like the czar's gold sabled crown burst into flame like a coal, his shoulders suddenly dazzling. And as the metropolitan stepped slowly forward, his sackos with its flat plated orphreys, orphreys flashed like a mirror in firelight. Um, and then later on, she actually describes um, like a painting redeemed from its shadowy burial and a light with Russian colors, yellow, brown, and blood red. Um, so she's just describing the whole thing like she's looking at a painting or like she's seeing the world as an artist. Yeah, I saw that again in the next chapters as they travel through the Russian countryside here. And people in the comments have been talking about like her descriptions of Russia. And I haven't really lingered on the descriptions very much until that chapter where they're traveling through this this beautiful countryside. And then it's like, okay, now I'm, I'm, I am enjoying this. There's a little bit of me that's like, get to the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but but it was a beautiful the next chapter has some really beautiful descriptions of winter and all of that so yeah I mean I don't want to jump ahead too much but I think it's it's interesting because we've been talking about how the landscapes are sort of like a metaphor for Lyman's frozen soul mm -hmm. but I think there's a sort of positive spin that you get in the next chapters which is that here's a freedom from the weight of all his trauma he can just kind of be in the moment and not be weighed down by all of those things and be kind of free from his trauma and the descriptions of the landscape and the, you know, the racing and the skiing and the hunting and all this stuff kind of go with that sort of like letting go of himself, letting go of who he used to be and how traumatized he is. And just um, like part, it's like part, part of his recovery in a way. And I also think the really vivid descriptions in the next chapter um, are also partly due to the fact that it's Dick and Chancellor getting to see this side of Russia that he has not been allowed to see the whole time he's been there, uh, which is one of the other reasons I thought that Lyman sort of forced him to come along so he could see all of this stuff that the Tsar has been trying to hide from him. Well, and because like, it's just so true to who Chancellor is. Like he's, he wants to explore and learn and this, this is like what makes him passionate. Yeah. Like imagine getting this from Gautier's point of view. It would be like, everything Ugh. was cold and miserable and I hated the food and it all sucked, you know? <laughs> but Chancellor. there's gold. <laughs> I wonder how much the gold in those icons is worth. Yeah. Um, since we're talking about it, should we move on to the next chapter? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So chapter nine, um, in the very beginning of it, Lyman uh, shows up to Dickon's room and we find out that the orders that Dickon had said to cancel the trip have been countermanded. Lyman is bringing him along whether he wants to go or not. Um, Adam Blacklock is still alive. Um, Dickon Chancellor tries to argue with Lyman, but it's kind of a furtive 
argument because he ends up going along anyway. Um, so throughout the trip with these beautiful descriptions, um, like I said, the Dickens is getting to see the Russia that was hidden to him. Um, they eventually get to uh, a church on the outskirts of Columbury. I, I'm never going to say that word right, so I'm not even going to try. Um, and they spend the night there. Dickens is given a very cold room, so he ends up trying to search for warmth and ends up in the chapel with Lyman, um, where it is warmer. Um, neither of them can sleep, so Lyman goes and grabs some candy wine for both of them to drink. And they spend most of the night talking uh, about trade and espionage, map making ideas, exploration, all of these things that sort of bond them together. Um, and we see that Dickens is sort of finding happiness in this trip. Um, there's the beautiful description about something that he hasn't really felt since his wife died. And we find out that it's this happiness and like exploration. Um, Lyman tells Dickens during this conversation that he will not go back home, that he is content to stay in Russia and help them with their problems. And then at the very end of this chapter, there's another beautiful description of the Northern Lights and like just the sense of adventure that Dickon is feeling and happiness. It's, it's a nice counterpoint to the nastiness that was the last chapter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have no concept of time, by the way, in this book. I am completely confused about how much time has been happening because there's an offhand comment on two, 283 about Chancellor says something about how um, something he could not do two years before when he was going to Moscow. And I'm like, have they been in Moscow for two years or was this a different trip? He it has to be the same trip, right? He was there before, though, because he came with you. Right. Yeah, I think it was the that trip. Was the two years before. OK, so he hasn't been. <laughs> so I was like, wait a second. How much time has passed? I yeah. feel like more time has passed than I think has passed, though. Are they still in the same winter? That like, I think so. Very of the same winter when they got there? Yeah, yeah. OK. The, the two years ago that he was in Russia was the trip that he took with Willoughby, Willoughby where Willoughby's got. two ships got separated. Okay, okay. Which they talk about, I right. think, it's this chapter or next chapter. Yeah. Lime is, like, so dismissive of Willoughby. I kind of loved it. Like, this guy was an idiot. Mm. Which it seems maybe he kind of was. Um, yeah. Um, no, I definitely struggle with time, but, um, but yeah, I think this is, I think that was the previous trip. I think the time I struggle with is like matching up Philippa's time to Lyman's time, knowing how long the letter would take to get there. But, right. Yeah. So like they're on different tracks, right? Like the things in the book that are happening, that are juxtaposed in the book are not necessarily happening simultaneously. I think you're correct. Yeah. I, but I'm not hundred percent sure. I, I could dig up a timeline somewhere if we really care. I don't, I just don't personally care. <laughs> um, I'm assuming they're going to meet up at some point. So. Yeah. I think the thing that, um, the only takeaway that I really have is like Lyman spends years in Russia. So he like goes through a lot of change there. So that's it. Yeah. Um, just going in order, looking at my notes, the first thing is on the first page where we have Lyman showing up, waking up Chancellor, um, and Lyman's face is untroubled by sleep. So Lyman has been up all night after whipping Adam. So I think that's also a very subtle little clue that tells us he is not as indifferent as he pretends to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting that Chancellor reads that as uh, insolent decadence, which I think is Chancellor's um, prejudice against Lyman because of what just happened. He's so angry. And so he's reading like this, he's probably got, you know, dark circles under his eyes and, you know, whatever. His face is showing that he hasn't slept. And Chancellor reads that in this very negative light, but we, the reader, know that's probably not what happened. And then Chancellor makes this like poor Philippa Somerville, Somerville comment, <laughs> like, uh, this poor girl, her husband is this cruel, cruel, indolent man you know i think chancellor has a little bit of a thing for philippa oh yeah i totally agree um so then we have lyman basically like 
you're going and you can't stop me from making you go, um, which we talked about earlier is because he, th he knows that Chancellor will really appreciate it and he doesn't want him to miss out on the opportunity just because he's pissed at Lyman, which is lovely actually. It's interesting how Chancellor kind of always thinks that he's going to anger Lyman with the things he says, but Lyman's usually very stoic and like not showing any of the expression at all. But then there is a moment in the church when like Chancellor tries to shut the conversation down where we get like an actual like flash quick moment where Lyman gets really angry, which is so rare to see his emotion shown like that. Yeah. So I take that as Lyman really likes Chancellor and really was trying to open up to him. And so the anger comes out because he's hurt at being rejected. Mm -hmm. um, which is just so funny because like, what's Chancellor supposed to think? Look at how you've been acting. Yeah. And the, the Chancellor makes some sort of comment. I, I think I underlined it so we can talk about when we get there. But he makes some sort of comment about Lyman's like ambition or something or his money. Like money for his mistress or something like that and Lyman gets ticked about it and Chancellor's like what else have you like he responds back pretty well he's like what else have you shown me <laughs> it's like oh yeah right it's true um so just going in order because I think uh, that when we get to that conversation that's the most interesting part but um I don't want to skip over like there's some bits like Christopher definitely has turned against him he says it isn't the bow and arrow we shelter behind it's the czar so he's, you know, bitter at Lyman now. Um, and we start out with the, the phrase, their, ex their estrangement complete. So Lyman and Chancellor are totally um, not on the same page right now, um, mm -hmm. which is what makes this so fun because by the end of it, they're closer than they've ever been. Yeah. I did love that Lyman's response to Christopher was like, no, you're wrong. <laughs> and so you, got, you get a tiny little sense that Lyman, like, doesn't want Christopher to to think this about him or like he does he does kind of want to doesn't want to lose that hero worship a little bit because he's like you know ah you find that this way but you're wrong you know and he says this is the czar who is sheltering behind me <laughs> yeah that's a that's a pretty loaded statement to say yeah also don't get overheard saying that <laughs> no oh, Lord, yeah um, I also just kind of enjoy the observations of, of Chancellor around the like huge gap between the poverty of the average people and then the incredible amount of money of the church and the czar. Um, he, I like that Chancellor is the kind of person that would notice those things and, and, and care about them. Mm -hmm. And I think that whole description sets us up for um what Lyman is saying on 290 where he basically outlines he outlines all this reform that he wants to happen for Russia and I think all these observations by Chancellor really set us up to understand like why what Lyman is saying is so important and why he might be dedicating so much time and energy and all of that to those to the possibility of those reforms yeah 100 percent like all the things that Lyman is calling out, roads and schools and universities and first class local government and decent drainage and irrigation is like all this stuff that would really be about helping the majority of the people, not about helping the rich. Right. Um, so like his, his whole thing is actually, so, it's just so Lyman, it's still like underneath, like, oh, I could help tons and tons of people if I reform this country. Um, and his explanation of why he's come in as a warrior, which is that um, it's needed most and it will impress the czar most and will create the climate in which other reforms may be contemplated. So it's just a means to an end. Like everything that everyone, you know, is like, oh, he's this warmonger is like, I mean, we already do. Like, no, that's not really what he wants to be doing at all. But it puts him in the position where the other stuff can happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it also, I think, shows us that he's not just Guzel's power minion. He's got his own ambitions, it, even though he, you know, obviously he didn't come here with them. He just went along with wherever Guzel took him. He didn't even know where he was going, but he can't help that side of him that wants to help people from coming out. Yeah. Um, and of course, being Lyman, he thinks at scale. He thinks about 
changing a whole culture to help millions or I don't know how many people lived in Russia at the time. Lots of people. Yeah. Um, okay. I did love this also, this side comment on, 19, on 289 where <clears throat> Chancellor's going to sleep or they're both sleeping and it says, to a healthy, vigorous man in his 30s, pursuing an open air life with a clear conscience and an active mind, this presented no problem. And then they both can't fall asleep. So the implication is like, neither of them are this clear conscious, active life, 30s, you know, like two each one. Neither of them are that because they both can't sleep. No, well, one of them definitely isn't. No. Not anymore, no more clear conscience. Um, there is some great descriptions of, um, it's on 286 and 287, of Slada Baba hunting um, and her sort of, you know, swooping around and diving and then catching things and coldly killing them. Um, and then followed by these descriptions of, I think it's basically skiing, um, but just this feeling of like freedom, right? And, and, um, like not being weighed down by anything. Mm -hmm. um, and it's this very kind of cold, amoral freedom, but also a very, like, it's so different from the walking on eggshells with the czar kind of stressful situation that we had before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think the descriptions of Slada Baba hunting are all just foreshadowing to what happens in the next chapter. And the, the amount of time that Donut has spent on it should have been a clear indicator that something was gonna happen, so. Well, yeah. like, you know, she's not gonna introduce that eagle without doing something. Yeah. Um, also, I really did love this, uh, at that, the, so the description you just pointed out about the skiing and, and all this, and Chancellor's, uh, he's safely ensconced in his tent and he hears all of this like, you know, revelry and laughter and, and uh, shouts and all this. And it says, uh, ex the violent pent of emotions. He experiences all the violent pent of emotions which would have better suited the temper of his absent son, Christopher. So he's having like this petty emotional anger response that he's like, I'm acting, and he tells himself, I'm acting like a child. Like he knows that his response is childlike or childish. But then he says it made him angrier because he knew that none of it was expected to interest him. So none of this stuff that's going on outside is he supposed to care about. And both the business and private life of his host were being conducted with every reason outside his presumed sphere of attention. So like, he's like, they're not letting me play, damn it. <laughs> he's mad about it. I want to learn this thing. Also, he, all, Lyman's doing all this stuff and he can't be part of it or he's not supposed to want to be part of it and, and he's curious and yeah. So I, I saw this as kind of like the beginnings of his um, changing his perception of Lyman. Yeah, well, and also I assume Lyman isn't actually excluding him by any means. Lyman, I'm sure, right. wants him to observe and participate. And right, right, right. The whole point of him coming along was. Yeah. Um, so then we have this sort of deep dive conversation. Um, we talked about the insomnia of um, both of them, but I think it's telling like we keep getting descriptions of Lyman's insomnia. Um, he doesn't sleep here. He didn't sleep after the night with Adam. So, you know, not that we're surprised, but dude is recovering from trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just super love the part where Lyman quotes from the book that Chancellor co-wrote um, and Chancellor's like, did he read it from my bag? And he's, and he's like, no, I have my own copy. And just, <laughs> oh, <laughs> like Lyman knew who he was this whole time and had read his book and was excited to meet him. Come on. Uh -huh. yeah. It seems a mischievous waste to chain that observing brain to Moscow, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I do I do love the this whole back and forth they have about like I talk with this guy and I'm this <laughs> like I learned this and and uh, I you know had a conversation with so and so about their their exploring thing and and uh, and I I love that we got to see um, the Nicholas Nicholas de Nicolay <laughs> he pops up in the conversation with an agitation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All I could think of was agitate the toes. I underlined that line specifically for you. 
So funny. Love how they observe him too, because it's like, yeah, his conversation is frivolous, but he's like actually done all this cool stuff. Yeah, he's super smart, even though he sounds like a kid. Yep. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I so I also I just love the like they have this conversation about um, Lyman says I am beginning to be singularly weary of peddling because. Chancellor thinks, oh, you're just, you just want me to do this so that I'll like sell things in Russia. Mm -hmm. And and Lyman's like, that's not why. Mm -hmm. Um, And then they both, um, you know, they sort of talk about how um, this is the exchange where he sort of accuses Lyman of of being, wanting just wealth and power. Mm -hmm. Um, And they, they sort of have both sort of, well, Chancellor has misunderstood Lyman and, and Lyman is saying, you know, you look like someone who's just a merchant and I look like someone who's just a warrior, but that's not what's really going on, mm-hmm. um, right? I receive the impression that you are a draper. Um, yeah. You receive the impression that I am personally ambitious. Um, and I, I just love the way that they then start talking about, um, you know, he says, you will travel with trinket and parchment, but you will have no patience for huckstering. Your eyes are on the Ob and the Lucinian Sea. Your heart, Master Chancellor, is in Kambalu. I don't actually know what all those places are, but just the idea that like, in order to function in the world and to be like funded so that you can do all this exploration, you can do all these cool things. You have to play this part, this like social role of like in, in Chancellor's case being a merchant and in Lyman's case being a warrior, mm-hmm. but that, that that's just a means to an end and that's not who they are in their souls. And I feel like this is such a relevant thing to the world we live in now where everything is about like, first, how are you going to like pay your rent? Right. But everyone has to find a way to sell themselves, but that's not like the be all and end all of who you are and what your soul is. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, it super resonated with me. <laughs> yes. You're doing your job as a means to an end to do something else. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's like the world you live in is structured that way where you have to, in order to survive, like chancellor isn't rich. He, he was like, I think he was like an orphan that was raised by the, by the Sydney's and just happened to be good at math. And so they raised him up into this position. Yeah. Um, so he, he has to do these things in order to like be able be, to have the opportunities. Um, but there's mm-hmm. so much more to him. Yeah. 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 And then I, I do love this phrase that comes up a couple of times where um, he talks about navigating. Earlier, he talks about, uh, oh, um, on 291, Lyman says, you do not travel by cloth, but by sea card and compass and star. And so then just as this sort of practical, like this is how you navigate on the ship. And then later, Chancellor's asking Lyman if he's going to go back to England, and Lyman says, or to Scotland, and Lyman says, um, no, I shall stay in Russia. I'm too far away from it all now, and if we're going to be metaphysical, I have no sea card or compass or star. And just that idea that Lyman, like I think in it, from a metaphysical perspective, it's like Lyman has no fixed point that he can navigate by to get back, you know, like that there's no, in his mind, there's no North Star, you know, like, and um, that's just incredibly sad that like his mother is no longer a fixed point that draws him back, you know, that there's no, um, there's nothing like that for him. We're certainly being set up to want him to find that again. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, I like. I want Philippa to be his North Star, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, shipping this since the very first. Month. I have been. I've been shipping this since it was uncomfortable to ship it because she was way too young. So. That's a pretty serious statement, D. Oh, that was bad. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to do it. Uh, um, that was a dad pun if I ever heard one. <laughs> I hope I'm not a dad. Um, 
on page 292, there's a really interesting phrase. I know we've sort of discussed in the past whether we think that Dick and Chancellor is actively spying or just sort of passively doing it because that's sort of part of the job description. But then Lyman says on 292 in the middle of a, a, a paragraph, um, espionage and maps, I suppose, are natural bedfellows and then sort of goes through you know, all of the people he sort of interacted with in the past. But I found that interesting that, you know, and I think that's another reason that Lyman wanted to bring him along to sort of show him this Russia that he couldn't have seen in Moscow. Yeah. I mean, it feels like for a cartographer, like the cartographer is going to bring back the maps yeah. to whichever like whoever's paying them or whichever government they're working for. So the whole like espionage and map making, I mean, it's almost not, it's not even hidden. It's just like, well, whatever, whatever knowledge you learn of the world and the shape of the world, you will bring it back to, to whoever you're working for. Yeah. And we also see that Dickon is an explorer at heart like that speech where Lyman says the Ob and the Exigenian Sea and Kambalu. I don't know for sure, but using context clues, I'm thinking that those are places further, like past the Siberian waste, like almost uh, on the coast of Mongolia or China, not the coast, the border. Yeah, because they talk about finding Cathay, a few mm -hmm. times, which is like I was saying last time, like they thought Cathay and China were different, but it's actually the same thing. But basically they're sort of dreaming of reaching China, like this sort of civilization that to them is mysterious and unknown, right? They don't have a way of, of getting there easily. And, and they talk later about like Marco Polo, right? So there's like just like little bits of information that have gotten to them, but they're so curious. Yeah. I don't, again, my European history is awful, but I don't know if the whole Siberian sort of plateau and uh, tundra was actually a part of Russia's lands at that time or not, if they had defined borders, including that, or if it was a lot smaller back in the 1500s. I think the big thing was that they had been um, like attacked and dominated by Mongolia. Mm -hmm. And they just kind of got out from that and they're trying to establish themselves separately, but I don't really know. Is, is that the area the Tartars are from? I think so. Okay, because I'm not sure either. I mean, I figured it was somewhere in uh, Eastern Russia, like in the steppes and the tundras and stuff. The, the main trying, thing that, oh, go ahead. I was just to say, I was trying to figure out the ethnicity of the people that she's describing at the end of chapter 10. Um, and I thought they were Mongolian, like, like the way that she does the description of like their faces were flat and their hair was very dark. And the, it sounded like, it sounded like that's who she was describing was the Mongolian people, but I don't know how, that seems like that's awfully far north for them. I mean, but again, I have no idea what the range of people was during. I, we should, um, if we really want to actually talk about this accurately, we should probably go read some history. Probably. I, I don't know, but I'm sure. I know, how do we get history without getting spoiled for things later? So. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll check some like Wikipedias and send you things that aren't too spoilery. I did, I'm just curious with Philippe. Yeah, like what was the range of, of Ivan the Terrible's Russia? <clears throat> how far did it extend? And then how far north did Mongolia go? Like into Siberia would be interesting. Um, yeah. Is there anything about this in the um, Dunnett Companion or is it more just like the texts and languages? Yeah, that tends to be more like translations and sort of like historical figure context. Um, I mean, I think, you know, we can just, we can just look on Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah. This is not something I'd be afraid of Googling for spoilers, because I don't think it has much bearing, but yeah, it's just nice to know. Um, so there's a couple of bits that I think also are interesting. One was when Lyman apologizes for inflicting a white knight upon Chancellor, meaning keeping him up all night. And he says it was, I think, worth the value of several dark ones. Mm -hmm. um, and then it also says later to 95, um, here outside of all probability had come upon him something unlooked for and rare, something he had experienced only a handful of times since Christopher's mother had died, which was the reason, although he would have told no one for his adventuring. Um, so this sudden, like, from they're totally at odds to now they're like, 
like-minded and more, much more bonded and it's just mm. it's really cool and i like to like you pointed out like this is the first time i think we've seen lyman with a man who is his equal mm-hmm. like yeah. maybe oliamro a little bit oliamro challenged him but he also challenged oliamro a lot um but here it's more like he lyman has things to learn from this guy yeah 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 and that they have you know like they have a similar interest and they have a they're excited about something together like it's just it's just not really a side of Lyman that we've seen before which is cool and I actually loved this paragraph that you just mentioned about Chancellor's wife and this something that he's looking for because I think I think this is just from a sentence structure perspective a really fascinating sentence and I know I get a little geeky about that but I love this where it says okay so Dick and Chandler's sarcasm was a defense here comma here comma outside all probability comma (laughs) had come had come upon him something unlooked for and rare and that something is not defined It's just something is unlooked for and rare. Something he had experienced only a handful of times since Christopher's mother had died, colon, which was the reason, although he would have told no one for his adventuring. So interestingly in this sentence, we don't know if the reason for his adventuring is the fact that Christopher's mother died, which meant now he goes off adventuring because his wife has died and et cetera, or, and I think more likely, it's the something that he's found that he goes off adventuring in search for this something that he had with Lyman in this conversation. And it's just, I just love that it's slightly ambiguous and invites us to really think about Dickens character and what he values and and like, what is it that he's found in this conversation with Lyman, this, you know, that they have this, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sort of camaraderie. A, a camaraderie, a coming together of minds. Uh, you know. Anyway, I just like the sentence. I thought it was nice. Yeah, I think. It's I, def- oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I do think we get some of an answer to what that something may be in the last sentence of the the chapter. Above the fear and his aching body and the pain of the pure and terrible air in his lungs, Dick and Chancellor dwelled with his heart on his wife and his sons and his soul in a limbo far farther than that and experienced happiness. So like it's a callback to that earlier paragraph. So just this sense of exploration and adventure and it's it's bringing him to a place that he hasn't seen that often since his wife passed. Oh, I think it's really interesting that she leaves it unnamed because all of these descriptions, these conversations, the landscape, the freedom, the skiing, the intellectual conversations are all kind of circling around a thing, but it has, it's like a prism with all these different aspects. And then reference to the Christopher's mother who died, like presumably they weren't going off exploring together and yet they had it, they had something that was whatever this is, happiness. Um, So I just, I think it's it's so evocative and poetic and it's probably a good thing that she doesn't try mm-hmm. to name it or like define the aspect of it, but she kind of gives you this whole picture that you can figure out what it is from. Yeah, exactly. It's good writing. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's talk about Richard Gray for a moment, if we will. Is he relation to the Greys of London that we know? Austin Gray and the Lord Gray with the lisp in the first book? I don't think we know. I think maybe yes, but only because it would be weird to have characters with the same name that aren't connected, but that's a complete assumption. Because what happens at the end of this chapter and the next chapter, Dunnett is setting up him up to look a little suspicious. And I'm just wondering. I don't actually think he did anything, but I think that there is some textual clues that it could have possibly been him that was released Slotababa. Because we see he's he picks up um, 
falconry really quickly. So he's had some experience with it before and how he interacts with Slada Baba. So I don't know. I just thought that was curious. I think you're right that she's planting clues. Um, I don't think she ever explicitly says if he's related to the other greys or not, but it's a good question. Yeah, I didn't see anything in the text that said, Yeah, at least not. I, I don't know if maybe I'd missed something earlier on because we we talked a little bit about Gray when Dickon first came to Russia, but he left him in Kolmogory and that was sort of it. So, and now suddenly he's back. So I don't know, just wondering. And I mean, remember we've got, you know, whoever Margaret Lennox is, um, spy slash person on the ground is still in question. Mm -hmm. So Gray is a candidate for that, isn't he? Like, did he? Yeah. yeah. And he wasn't in that list, was he, that that Dickon made of the guys with him? Because he wasn't with him. Right. So there's that possibility. I don't know. I still think she has somebody who's been with Lyman for longer, but. I do too. It's just, I had to mention it because of, you know, the clues that have been planted. So and I think they may be red herrings, but. We'll see. But Lennox, Margaret Lennox could also have more than one person. True. <laughs> like there's there's nothing that says that she only paid one guy. So <laughs> she could definitely have, I mean, she's wealthy and intelligent and vindictive. So <laughs> All right. shall we do chapter 10? Chapter 10. All right. So this is a bit of a shorter chapter. We probably should have gone on and read the next chapter, but it's okay. Um, we'll get to that next time. Uh, they arrive at Lampogny Ostra, which is this sort of island fur trading post. Um, and this is where Lyman and Dickon sort of talk about Hugh Willoughby and what happened with the expedition two years ago, how the ships got separated and Hugh Willoughby's crew sort of, they didn't starve, they froze to death, unfortunately. Um, we also learn here that Dickon wants to further explore Russia and Siberia, and Lyman agrees with that, but tells him that he must sail back home to England first. Um, there's a great part in the tavern where Lyman gets to play music again. I was so happy about that. Um, and then uh, once Dickon retires to the tent with Richard Gray, he's woken up because there is a sleigh race happening between the reindeer. Um, Dickon realizes while he's going through the tent that Slada Baba is missing and he immediately feels like he needs to warn Lymond. So he goes to the sleigh race, misses the start of it, but ends up sort of getting his own sleigh by, I don't know, almost stealing it from another guy. <laughs> uh, he tries to catch up with Lyman to warn him. And then of course, Slada Baba shows up and attacks one of the reindeer from another sleigh. Um, Lyman realizes it's a problem, so holds his hand out to try and have the eagle perch on it. And then it's a little confusing, but in the end, both of the sleighs crash. And you get the feeling that this was a, an elaborate setup to try and assassinate Lyman, which, God, is Albany around again? <laughs> That's what I was thinking too. Like, is Did this come an back? elephant situation? <laughs> So like, is he lurking in the shadows somewhere? Because this plot just reeks of his incompetence. Oh, man. That is an excellent point. This is a very job and thing to do. And he's not dead. He's just exiled, right? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he's in Russia. He shows up in Russia. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought this totally had sort of shades of the elephant stampede <laughs> parade thing. Mm -hmm. And like the rabbit. Yeah. Hunt. Yeah. 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 So what happens at that confusing part also is that like Lyman puts his hand out for Slada Baba, but he doesn't have the like it's protection he normally yeah. has. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so the talons are going to like cut up his arm and Dickon has the lure he's grabbed. So he throws that to try to get Slada Baba to like latch onto that instead of Lyman. Mm -hmm. That's how I took it. Yeah. yeah. That's what it I don't know enough about falconry to understand exactly what the lure is. I'm assuming it's like bait or food or something there was definitely um, the implication that whoever has been looking after slada baba which i don't think we know 
who's been assisting Lyman in the falconry stuff, but whoever, I assumed it was like another soldier or servant or someone, they have been deliberately starving the bird to make her angry. Yeah. So, like she's been, food has been kept from her. Um, so clearly this is actually a fairly well thought out plot. I don't know if the, I, my, I wonder if the sleigh race was spontaneous. And so then the person just decides like, well, I'll do it now. Or if somebody manipulated this sleigh race to happen. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, it was a challenge. Lyman wasn't the one that instigated it. It was a challenge from right. the laps, I think, or one of, one of the, um, one of the groups of people that are there. Yeah. And I don't remember all the names of the groups, but it was a challenge to the czar. So Lyman sort of had to answer the call and say, well, I can't not take part in this, especially since some of the other men that he was traveling with, one of them was very drunk and a couple of them had frostbite. So he was like the natural choice or else he would have probably let somebody else take care of it. So do y'all have any guesses on who our new Daubeny is? I mean, there's implications that it would be gray because he would be, um, he would know enough about falconry to release the eagle and sort of, but he's got some, a little bit of, um, of a link with the eagle so he wouldn't attack him. Um, it's, it's hard to assume that it was Danny or Ludo, we talked about both of them last time possibly being traitorous, but they're not here anymore. Although they could have agents in the Russian, uh, Russians traveling, the Streltsy traveling with Lymond because they have been training them. Yeah. I mean, our so, options, who are our options? Our options are the, are Gray, the Russian captain guy. Alexander. Yeah, Alexander. Um, there's another named Russian guy. I can't remember. Um, there's like a couple of Russian soldiers whose names we know. Mm -hmm. but no, I don't. <laughs> um, and then Gray, and then like nameless person that, you know, just random nameless person who's working in the pay of someone else. You know, like I, I think those are our options, right? Do we have any other? Is Venceslas still traveling with him as a servant? No. no. So did I skip anybody? I mean, it's not Dickon. Right, it's not Dickon or Lyman, so. No. Um, but it really could be any of the others at this point, so. I think Gray's a good guess, uh, if only because they haven't had any problems up to now and now he's there and now they have problems so that's that's another but I don't know. you could also throw out the possibility that margaret lennox isn't lyman's only enemy he's probably got plenty of people in russia who are like who the hell is this guy getting so close to the czar true well, could, i mean that would be an argument for like alexander or the other russian guy whose name i can't remember um that there's resentment about uh, lyman being so close and and lyman has had this just recent very public sign that it was almost like Lyman was part of the czar's family because that blessing thing that happened at the ceremony was to the czar and the princes and Lyman. So it's like the czar has sort of publicly adopted Lyman kind of in this way. So you can see why there'd be a fair amount of resentment of this outsider's power coming into coming in so that there could be something. So that would argue for one of the local Russian guys doing it. Um, so we kind of skimmed over this, but Lyman didn't just talk about Chancellor's next journey and, and suggest he go back to England first. He offered to fund his next journey. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's a pretty huge deal. And I think that's part of why Chancellor rushes to save him in addition to their bond, but they, like Lyman just went really far in, in the way that he offered to fund him because um, 
Chancellor is funded on this contingency of trade. And so he has to go around like hawking wares, which he doesn't really care about at all. Um, and Lyman's approach is I should impose no obligations except that of traveling as widely and as far as you can and of returning to report on it. So he, like Lyman's like, I'll fund you to just explore and, and write. Yeah. Right, which is a <laughs> blank check to go have fun. Yeah. Like, we'll have adventures. Yeah. I mean, it's his absolute, um, his, it's like Chancellor's dream, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and you will have to recoup by publishing a commentary on Cathay. So, this idea of like exploring wider than anyone in their culture has and, you know, and just reporting back on it. Um, so, it's, it's, I mean, I just think it's super interesting, right? We sort of talked about Lyman fanboying him and it's like, Lyman is really fanboying him. Lyman really respects this guy and wants to like help yeah. him. Mm -hmm. doing I also that. love the fact that Lyman's financial troubles apparently didn't last very long. <laughs> know. Like, he dumps his entire fortune into the Turkish, you know, those diamonds in the Turkish thing. And now he's apparently got enough of a fortune that he can bankroll an entire exhibition trip, which is not cheap. So he's got the Donati fortune, which I guess went to Philippa, and the Dom de Dutan's fortune, which I guess went to him. And I'm sure Guzel is funding him. So right. Yeah. And he's getting paid from the Tsar. Yes, and he's got yeah. he's getting paid a lot. Uh -huh. He's getting paid an obscene amount from the Tsar. So yeah. But I love I love that what's he gonna do with that money? He's gonna fund ex exploration and adventure and learning. And then I think it's doubly telling after this conversation that one of the next things we see him do is play music again like to let that little bit out and not be so cold and like I just I love the fact that he was playing something I was like yay well and it was really interesting because we were talking before about how he doesn't have rapport with his men the way that he did in the previous books and this is the first time we actually see him doing that sort of bonding thing and building rapport with them and it's still calculated it's still Lyman he's not really drunk he's still doing this partially as a, a, a way of you know manipulating the situation to, to build the rapport of the team basically but it's way above and beyond anything he's done so far it's much more human than like ice prince Lyman yeah but there's a little bit of me that's like these are the wrong guys <laughs> like do it with the other guys. And also, I think it's it's important to note that um, he was calculating before too, like before when he developed rapport with the men and, you know, did all that stuff. It was also a calculation and it was also him being deliberate in that as well. So, um, I, I, you know, does Lyman ever do anything without having like four reasons for doing it or something? So. Sometimes, but yeah, just the fact that he's able to take himself this far, even if it's calculated, he couldn't let loose and play music yeah. like literally yeah and i love chancellor's observation um the half drunk army of the vivoda bolshoya had conceived that the vivoda bolshoya drunk this night was their brother chancellor knew that he was not and was not mm -hmm. right <laughs> not drunk not the brother <laughs> but, yeah. um and i do i i also loved the bit where um he chancellor like shuts gray up <laughs> where he's like hush <laughs> like you're gonna ruin it <laughs> so yeah so like Ch i think it's interesting to see chancellor like becoming uh like his observer he's both observant which we've seen before but he's but he's discerning as well like he's observant and he can understand what he's seeing and seems to be making fairly accurate assumptions about what's going on with lyman at this point so um, jumping ahead to the like bird attack sequence, there's this amazing description of Slada Baba that I just like it because it's like out of a fantasy novel. It, it makes it so scary. Um, this is when she's attacking one of the reindeer and it says the antlered head of the deer next to Lyman's was invested with a demoniac presence dark and vengeful as the Stymphalian bird with wings, beak, and claws of iron, piercing eye and brain with its spears, sucking out sense, air, and life with the bat of its murderous pinions. It's like, it's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, it really is. And I love that she set up this whole sequence at the top of 308, 
where he Ch chancellor is like locking everything down and like everything's fine and he's like it's you know he walked through she checked that everything was secure and then all was in order and then the eagle is missing <laughs> and it's it's like this lovely everything's great everything's great it's all together oh crap <laughs> and then we get led into this whole sequence that like you said is gets deeply terrifying yeah. And it's really telling that Chancellor doesn't really stop to think. He just acts on instinct of like, oh, something's wrong. I got to go tell Lyman. I got to help. He's like, he's a good guy. Yeah. And again, like, that's discerning. Like, there's something in him that knows that this was very bad. Um, even though he kind of like halfway through this sleigh trip, he's like, oh, maybe I was dumb. Like, <laughs> I shouldn't have done it. But he keeps going. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's very human, right? To second guess yourself. But he was right the first time. <laughs> like I'm making this really dramatic statement. Maybe I didn't need to. Yeah. Yeah. So Constantine is the name of the other Russian. The oh. lieutenant. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. He's the one, and it's interesting. He's the one that sort of gives the news that the sleigh ride is happening. He mm -hmm. he knocks on the door and then Chancellor sort of dithers around for a bit before doing anything. So is that possible? Is that a possibility that Constantine came in and let Slada Baba out then? That's a possible, I don't know. Mm, maybe. It does say, this is just my brain in overdrive. Um, Chancellor remembered that Constantine himself still had a hand bandaged from frostbite, but he could be hiding scars from the eagle attacking him when he released him. Although, no, because that would have, if he's releasing the eagle now, then his hand wouldn't be bandaged yet. So never mind. That was dumb. I don't know. Maybe he did it before. Like it's maybe, true. We don't know how long the eagle's been gone. Yeah, maybe maybe the eagle's like just at alternate location. Um, we shall see. Hmm. Yes. Um, so we definitely end on a cliffhanger. What do you think is going to happen next? I think they both survive. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, what I kind of hope happens is that they both survive, Lyman and Dickon survive, and this sort of like buddy movie thing we've got going on continues, <laughs> that, that then they realize like they're in danger, somebody's after Lyman, they got to figure out who it is, like I would love that. <laughs> I don't know if that's what's going to happen, <laughs> but it would be kind of cool if, if um, I, I think this whole book, actually this whole series, I've just wanted Lyman to like have somebody on his side <laughs> that like he's had lots of people on his side, but he hasn't necessarily embraced that fact. And I, I've always just wanted him to have like somebody to walk with him through something difficult that he's not shouldering it all by himself and and that he has companions and all that so so it would just be nice to have this moment if they could work on it together like whatever it is so i don't know i wonder if now that they are a little closer the dickon will finally reveal sort of the threat that's been levied against him from margaret that if he doesn't bring Lyman back, his life may be forfeit. And if that might help persuade Lyman one way or another to leave Russia and go back to Scotland. Yeah, because he, you know Lyman did make that very, very clear, like you have to take the ship back to England before I'll pay for your journey. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if he does that, I mean, Margaret Lennox is gonna kill him or have him killed, so yeah so the whole the whole journey isn't going to happen and if Lyman really does want this exploration adventure thing to happen then he's got to solve that problem so do you or maybe Lyman has been planning to leave Russia and go back to England this whole time and that's his escape route to go back with Dickon and he's just being coy about it I don't think I, that I, would be it but it's always a possibility I think, I think something's going to have to happen for him to leave Russia. Yeah, something does have to happen. There has to be some sort of catalyst to get him out of Russia because clearly he's not going to stay in Russia forever. So. I hope not. Yeah, so something's got to happen. 
I mean, now that he's had a another assassination attempt, I'm sure this won't be the last one. Because it failed. Do you think he'll end up funding Chancellor's Voyages? I hope so. I mean... My guess is no, because, but mainly because I've never heard of him. <laughs> and so I feel like if there had been some sort of like big exploration to China on the part of an Englishman, like we would have heard of him like we have Cook and like the various other explorers. So I'm thinking no, but it would be really cool. <laughs> Like I, I hope he does. I hope, I hope it's like Dickon and Christopher off on a like map making adventure together or something. So, that also feels really optimistic. So. Do you think um, Lyman is going to voluntarily leave Russia, or like what's going to make him go? Well, I mean, what do you mean by voluntarily? Like I can see him leaving Russia under duress because there's someone in trouble that he has to go save. Like yeah, I feel- yeah, I guess that's the thing, cause you were like, maybe he's thinking the whole time about leaving. But I guess my question would be like, do you think he, is he planning to leave or is it like something's gonna happen that like forces him to go? Yeah. Well, I don't we know haven't, to leave. We haven't seen his reaction to, um, Philippa's letter yet the one where she says oh Sibylla isn't your mother so either it's happened and he just threw it away or it hasn't happened yet he hasn't gotten that letter that might be part of it Philippa yeah. you should not write these things in letters <laughs> no it's oh, a bad gosh. move oh hi um I feel like he definitely like I feel like there's gonna have to be some sort of catalyst like, I think at this point in this story, Lyman is not planning on ever going back. And he is planning on staying in Russia. But I think he will go back. So something has to happen to change his mind, whether that actually changes his mind or whether, or rather maybe he will be sort of manipulated and or coerced into returning for some reason. How would Ivan react to Lyman leaving? Not well. Not good. <laughs> That's going to be not good. They're going to have to prepare to get out of Russia <laughs> safely. Well, and it's not going to strengthen the bond between Russia and England right now. Well, Lyman isn't English, but I don't know. I have a feeling there would be repercussions. Especially if he leaves with the English. Yeah. That's going to be bad for Russia-England relations. So. What do you think is going to happen with Adam? He better be okay. Yeah. I think there's going to be some resentment towards Lyman. But I still think he'll be loyal because it's Adam. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid he'll be, like, I think there's definitely some disillusionment that is happening in his, like, I think that he, my guess is he will feel like the relationship that he thought he had with Lyman. Oh, hi, sweetie. <laughs> over my book again. I put it down and she doesn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I hope that he sees that Lyman didn't have much of a choice in the matter and that he did everything that he could possibly do to save him, so... I mean, I think that there's a possibility that even if he does see that, like even if he does actually understand that Lyman made the best choice to save his life that he could, I can still see his, his relationship with Lyman being permanently damaged. Like, cause again, I mean, we've talked before about trauma and just the impact that trauma has on people. And, and this is incredibly traumatic mm. on multiple levels for Adam. So for the consequence of this to be his relationship with Lyman, I can see that as a legitimate yeah, uh, like even casualty. Under, yeah, even if he understands intellectually right. 
who would want to be around Diamond anymore after yeah. that? Right. That the the cost of this is their relationship. Which is sad. Um, any, I guess, final um, hopes, wishes, expectations um, for the rest of the series based on what we just read? I do hope that Lyman does go home before the end of this book, that it's not like the last page is him leaving Russia. Like, I hope it happens before that, so. Hey, me too. I would like, I would like Lyman and Philippa to have some like genuine interaction at some point, <laughs> like, I feel like their interactions have been so colored by each other's perception of the other person as opposed to the reality of the other person. And I don't know if they've ever actually had a conversation of just sitting down and genuinely talking about things, you know? And so I would really like that to happen. Um, but then I kind of want that for Lyman with everyone. Like I want that conversation, I want him to have that conversation with his mother. I want him to have that conversation with his brother and with Jarrett and with Marta and with, you know, with everyone. We just all sit in a circle and have therapy. <laughs> um, but as far as, yeah, I want him to go back in this book. Um, I would like to sort of extract the St. Mary's people from Russia and them back in with the St. Mary's. Well, I guess why, I mean, because I definitely felt the same thing reading this, was like, can we leave Russia now? Like, okay, I've had it with Russia, can we go? But like, why, why do you think, you know, readers generally probably are reading this thinking like, okay, like, can you go back to Western Europe now? Well, part of it is that it just feels ominous. Like, there's just this, there's just this like dread hanging over all this time in Russia because Ivan is so capricious and you just don't know what he's going to do. And their positions are vulnerable. And so it's like, just get out of there. <laughs> um, but yeah, but also we want to go back to the people we know and have them. I, mean, I think for me, it's like, I want someone to crack the shell of Lyman. I want people that know him and can call bullshit and be like, Tell us your feelings. What's going on here? Right. Yeah. Stop acting like this. Yeah. yeah. I want like Kate and I want Kate and Sibylla and Philippa to like just have at him. So yeah, I would love um, you know, Kate, right? She would yeah. she really like, would not stand for this. I mean, I feel like the other thing is like we as the reader went through the trauma of haunted frankincense with him and we want the catharsis of like dealing with that and like someone to understand what he's been through and like give him a hug you know yeah um, like at least for me I felt um I really wanted something like kind of emotionally conclusive to the arc that ended Pawn mm -hmm. and didn't get it and then we like I was expecting it in this book and instead we're off in frozen Russia and Lyman is unreachable and I'm like I want that catharsis so badly yeah I mean I think uh I've talked about this with you before, but one of my favorite tropes in fiction, in all of fiction, is is a hurt comfort trope where a character is experiences a deep hurt, but then also experiences comfort after that. And we have had the hurt in this series, but there has been no comfort. And so I, I yeah, I completely agree. Like I want that, I need that finish to this trope of mm -hmm. the deep deep damage and hurt that has happened to this character i need that um sort of redemption and comfort to happen and it just hasn't and i needs a hug yeah a group hug yeah so, yeah yeah but it's like he's covered in razor blades right now you wouldn't want to hug him at the moment no no but yeah, the people, the people that could get through were all back and back home basically. So that's why I think that's why we're longing for him to go there. Yeah. All right. Any final thoughts? I'm liking this book more. So I'm looking forward to the next section. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. It's, it's picked up. Yeah. And once we get through a lot of Mary Tudor and a lot of like trying to keep track of different um, 
Russian names, <laughs> it, it, the book starts to get, get a lot more compelling. Right. Well, and also just this, uh, for me, the relationships between characters are what are really compelling. And I feel like we've got more of that now. Like we understand more about who people are in relationship to each other and how they're interacting in those ways. So I just enjoy the book more with that. For sure. Well, thank you everyone for watching and commenting. We appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah.